our lesson today is on God's provision of a successor to the throne of David. Who would have known that this lesson would begin, at least I wasn't aware, on a marker, 9-11. 21 years ago, 9-11-2001, indeed, we had a marker. These United States were attacked for the first time uh, by an outside enemy. And who would have known this week we came to another marker with Queen Elizabeth II, 70 years of rule in uh, England, in which she was the uh, protector of the Christian religion. And I really think if you know anything about history at all, that we have hit probably the peak thing and we're sliding down, except for the intervention of a revival from God. Now, I've told you before, and you know it, so I'll do it once more uh, so you can get this over with. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet. And I've worked all my life for a nonprofit organization. <laughs> so I can't tell you uh, that this is so, but it's in the air. Most people, even seculars, say there's something wrong, something radically wrong. Life has changed dramatically. And that's what we hit here. We've come to the peak and David's 40 years were, with a couple exceptions, great years. God called him a man after my own heart. Yeah. Uh, and he had a son and God was gracious in giving him that son. But, uh, this successor to the throne sets up 11 chapters in the Bible of uh, the downfall of a great man with every sort of inducement that would have signaled his uh, success. So turn to 1 Kings uh, chapter 1. I'm not going to read this whole section. It's a long section, but an important one. So let me read for you the beginning of verses here, chapter 1, uh, verse 1, and we will go uh, down through uh, uh, the first uh, section here. So when King David was old and well advanced in years, he could not keep warm even when they put covers over him. So his servants said to him, let us look for a young woman to attend the king and keep care of him. She can lie beside him so that our Lord the king will keep warm. She was to be a hot water bottle, uh, I take it. Uh, uh, all right, I'll give you time to think that over. Uh, and then they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful girl and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. By the way, this Shunammite is probably the same one that starred in the Song of Solomon. Same girl. Uh, so the girl was very beautiful, I can bet. And she took care of the king and waited on him. But the king had no intimate relations with her. The Bible is careful to say what was going on. Now, Adonijah, his mother was Haggath, put her himself forward and said, I will be king. How about that for chutzpah? <laughs> to say, I'll be king. Uh, and he got chariots and horses ready with 50 men to run ahead of him. His father had never interfered with him by asking, why do you behave as you do? Wow, what an indictment here. This kid had everything at his uh, beck and call, but his dad never challenged him on anything. Uh, he was very handsome and was born next to Absalom. Well, Absalom, we have just learned in the previous section in 2 Samuel, had also tried to take over 
as king, you remember, and had failed. So Adonijah, verse 7, conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abathar, the priest, and they gave him their support. Uh-oh, here goes breaking up of the empire. But David, uh, excuse me, but Zadok, the priest, Beniah, son of Jehoiada, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, and Rai, uh, David's special guard, did not join Adonijah. So Adonijah was uh, then sacrificed uh, sheep, cattle, and fatted calves at the stone of Zoheleth in, in Rogel. He invited all of his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah who were royal officials, but they did not invite Nathan the prophet or Beniah or the special guard, or his brother Solomon. Then Nathan asked Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king without our Lord David's knowing it? Now then, let me advise you how you can save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Uh, Change in governments in those days was lethal. And in order to make sure there was no opposition, they killed off all who would have a claim to the throne. So Bathsheba and Solomon's life were both in danger. Go in to King David and say to him, My lord the king, did you swear to me your servant, surely Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? And while you are still talking to the king, I will come in and confirm what you have said. So Bathsheba then proceeded. This is a tactic which uh, the prophet here set up and he said, I'll be the one that confirms that. So while you're still giving this story, I'll come in and repeat the same words to the king, which is what takes place in that section there. So the first two chapters in 1 Kings are truly transitional chapters. Transitional in the Bible, transitional in government, transitional also in the way in which people are coming to know the Lord. So critical scholars love to see these two chapters, not as the beginning of 1 Kings, but as the conclusion to what they call the succession narrative that stretches from 2 Samuel 9 through chapter 20 and includes 1 Kings 1 and 2. But this scholarly invention, and it is an invention, rather than a scriptural designation, <laughs> does not fit our focus, for it is more on the character and life of Solomon as presented in these scriptures and chapters. So the time is approximately 970 B.C., and the first four verses in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, seem to paint a picture of King David, who was, to quote, old and well advanced in years, verse 1. And he was having trouble keeping warm, even when they put covers and blankets over him, verse 1. So at this point in his life, King uh, uh uh, David appears to have little zest for life in his senior years, and with the result that matters of state were beginning to slide, and events were about to pre preempt any wish or instruction. <clears throat> uh, David uh, might give uh, what was to happen uh, for a future king, but lo and behold, it was uh, not available. So it was time someone took action, and that person seems to be Nate the prophet, or Nathan. 
I call him Nate because I feel like I know him. Uh, but at any rate, it's Nathan. So in the narrative, in 1 Kings chapters 1 through 2, verse 12, uh, that takes us from the possible insurrection of power against David to the death of King David, it can be covered in five major scenes. First of all, David's son, Adonijah, put forward himself uh, as uh, the new leader. He asserts himself saying, I will be king. Uh, and uh, that's in verses 1 through 10. Secondly, the second thing that happens here, the prophet Nathan and David's queen Bathsheba, you remember how she became queen, it was through the uh, David not going out in the battle, walking in, in summer evening up on the lofty tier of the palace, looks down and sees uh, Bathsheba, who was the wife of one of his officers uh, in the army, now out fighting. And so uh, Nathan the prophet and this queen now uh, halt Adonijah's quest by pleading with the king to act immediately. Thirdly, uh, David therefore declares Solomon to be king in verses 28 through 40. Fourthly, Adonijah's coronation festivities, which had almost been completed, <laughs> suddenly came to a halt when news came that Solomon had just then been summarily and quickly uh, made king in Israel, verses 41 to 53. And finally, the fifth movement here, King David gives his final charge to Solomon, which is uh, followed by David's death in chapter 2, 1 through 12. So let's go directly to the text and show God's provision of a successor to the throne of David. And I'm going to choose verse 48, which if you do Bible study, you generally try to uh, have a little notebook along with you and write down where is the heart of this passage? Where does it come to grips with the whole thing? And usually there is a verse. <laughs> this one is verse 48. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has allowed my eyes, David speaking, who has allowed my eyes, King David's, to see a successor on my throne today. So that leads us to uh, looking for what are we going to talk about? And usually you need a noun. It has to be plural and it has to be abstract because we don't want to talk in the concrete about back there then. We want to talk that it is God still his current word to us. So it must be in the abstract. So uh, I'm going to take provisions as my noun and plural noun and abstract noun. Three characteristics, plural noun and abstract. And I'm going to ask one of the five questions. I've taught <laughs> future pastors, missionaries, always ask one of the five. Remember, fifth grade now, this is not new stuff. They taught a journalism class, and they said, if you're seeing accident, I want this class to write up who, what, why, where, when, and how. Five W's and one H. So you have to cover all of them if it's a good news story. Who, what, why, where, when, and how. But when you preach or teach, You've got to focus, and therefore you can't have people jumping back and forth between who and what and why and where. Which one are you talking about now? So you have to choose one. 
<coughs> so I did. What? What are the provisions that God gave to David and gives now to us as he provided a successor to rule his throne? And here are the provisions that God gave. Therefore, the provision of an incentive to act. Verses, chapter 1, verse 1. And, uh, 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 no, 1 to 10, that should be. Correction. And then the provision of an alternative plan. Verses 11 through 27 in verse uh, in the chapter 1. That's the second provision. So God gave an incentive to David to get up and get gone as your last act. And he gave the provision of an alternative plan. Verses 11 through 27. Thirdly, the provision to install Solomon as king. Verses 28 through 40. And the provision of making the kingdom secure, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So those are the four provisions we're going to be talking about. Let's talk about the first. The provision of an incentive to act, uh, verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> At the death of David... Uh, as he was, uh, as it was about to occur, things were beginning to unravel and get a little out of hand due to David's laxity in daily administering the affairs of government. Not too bad a text to be talking about today. Uh, things are about to unravel. Uh, two of David's sons seemed to have been in line to be the next king, uh, 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 Absalom, and now Adonijah. Uh, have tried, and uh, David had promised to Bathsheba, no, it is your son Solomon that God has chosen. But David was showing real signs of being a little slow and somewhat out of tune with what was going on around him. In fact, he was even being, <laughs> if you don't mind my punning a little bit, cool about it. Uh, he just plain couldn't get any heat in his body. Uh, he was having trouble keeping his body heat up. Uh, so that's what he was concentrated on. But history was demanding a real leader at this point. As a result, his servants spoke up and decided to look for a young virgin who could attend the king and lie beside him and to keep him warm, verse 2. And the text makes clear this was strictly a method of supplying heat therapy. Uh, so she was sort of a a warm blanket for him and had nothing to do with sexual provisions or any sort of dysfunctional sexuality on David's part. Verse 4. The woman the servant selected uh, for this aged monarch was the beautiful Abishag. A-B-I-S-H-A-G. Abby, my father, and then Shag, a young virgin from the town of Shunem, hence she was called a Shunemite. Uh, she may have been the same woman, and I think she was, who appeared in the book of Song of Solomon. And uh, you remember the story told there of how Solomon went by one day being borne by 60 of his men on his palanquin, which is like a big pool table, with his throne up on top of that, and they were all fighting for the honor of bearing up the king. I've been in Guatemala uh, when they've had feast days, and uh, where 
the uh, men fought each other literally uh, to bear up the uh, palanquin, this big table, looked like a pool table, same size. And uh, they had the Virgin Mary on it. And then in front of them, people with buckets of flower petals would go and line the whole street with a rug of uh, uh, beautiful uh, petals. And uh, something like this was taking place in that day as Solomon went by the nut orchards, uh, which were owned by the brothers of Abishag. And he said, uh, come to my palace. And she uh, ultimately resisted and said, no, no, no. I, I have a shepherd boy I'm in love with. And love triumphed over even a king and his wish. And he comes to know that. Uh, and says at the conclusion of the Book of Song of Solomon, love is as strong as death. You can't break it. It's a gift from God. How about that for teaching? Well, that's another book. But at any rate, uh, now it's important to notice the biblical writer said his father had never interfered with him. Why do you believe... Now, why do you behave, actually, first of all, as you do, he asked in verse 6, to add to this delinquency in child rearing, Adonijah was at the same time handsome and was born next after Absalom, who had, and that's in verse 6, last part of verse 6. Thus, in these brief vignettes, we are given clues that Adonijah was also terribly ambitious. Matter of fact, back in 2 Samuel, he set up his chariot with the horses and his 50 men that ran in front of that horse with the people that were going to the king to seek uh, the king's advice and judgment. And he would say to them, Wait, you don't have to go through all that trouble. It's a long line. Uh, can I help you? And he would give the advice, which was always advantageous to the person. So he built up this way a large following uh, that uh, you could find in Second Samuel. So uh, in this way, uh, he was planning to uh, run for the office of a president, uh, not to mention the political and military support he had raised up in the meantime, verse 7 and verse 9. All this spelled danger and a real threat not only to uh, Bathsheba and Solomon, but to the whole uh, empire too as well, to the kingdom of God. So where did this begin? with Adonijah's lack of parental discipline. Here was a man that was great in administration and ran a great country, but apparently couldn't run his own kids. And anymore, anyway, he though he was the wisest man in the world, he must have lacked an awful lot because he had, what, uh, 300 wives? And 700 concubines? Come on, come on, come on. Well, I'll get off that. But at any rate, uh, this was the moment that was filled with such danger as any in Israel would face. In fact, times of transition from one ruler to the next are almost always times of great peril. We're watching that right now as uh, Charles III is ruled in as king to take over a queen who more than anyone in England has ruled seven decades. Wow. And 15 prime ministers. And two days before she passed away, she welcomed in the new prime minister. Amazing. Amazing feat in history. God blessed her because 
to the degree that she did, she stood up for what was right and for the gospel. Well, uh, at any rate, that's what was taking place. And Adonijah's lust for power and position are not the usual marks of a distinguished leader among the people of God, much less in any country of the world. Adonijah had clever, cleverly gathered to his side the head of the army, Joab. That was David's sister's kid, Joab, J-O-A-B. And uh, he selected him for his army leader, and he had taken Abathar, A-B-I-A-T-H-A-R, as his high priest. So he now had the leader of the army and the leader of the church, as it were, in that day. But he had purposely left out of his entourage Zadok, the priest. There were two in David's day. So he chose one, Abathar, but not Zadok. Z-A-D-O-K, who was the top priest for King David. He had also decided not to choose Benaiah, uh, one of the military bureaucrats, uh, and he had decided not to choose Nathan for his court prophet, uh, or even Chimai and his friends, along with David's special uh, crack guard, which were the Carathites and Pelthites, which are like the Swiss guard that is used, for example, in Rome. It would be very, very similar to Carathites and Pelthites, uh, verses 7 through 8 and verse 44. This list indicates that Adonijah understood that there was a marked division of power and influence within the government of David and he was ready to move quickly in a surprise coup to tilt the forces in his favor. But he must act quickly. But in the providence of God, these moves would be the very sorts of events when they were rehearsed to David just in time so he could move to correct the situation. However, David had to take immediate steps to put an alternative plan because already festivities were going on to the south of Jerusalem at uh, Ein Rogel. At the spring of Ein, uh, E-I-N, Rogel, R-O-G-E-L, several hundred yards south of the city of David, Adonijah had set the stage for his installation which was now going on in verse 9. Almost all the king's sons and all his brothers, except uh, yeah, Solomon, had been invited uh, uh, to the feast in Adonijah's honor of being the next king in verse 9. So they had a big banquet. Once again, it must be stressed that Nathan the prophet had not been invited, nor had Adonijah's brother Solomon, nor had the military man Beniah, nor had the priest Zadok, or the Carathites or Pelethites. So the die was set for a major coup, which some were going to lose their lives if this coup survived and succeeded, especially Solomon and uh, Bathsheba. So this exclusion of these otherwise respected persons uh, showed that Adonijah was prepared not for peaceful transition, uh, but rather for sudden death for all potential uh, claimants that would contest his being ruler. Was this the reason why these sons of David had been invited to a joint meal? Or was this invitation an attempt to get their full endorsement? Or were they still trying to figure out what was going on? We don't know. Yes, there would be losers 
from the previous government who would eventually need to be totally liquidated and annihilated by the opposition uh, in order for the coup to work. The plot was quickly darkening as the meal got under full swing. So this takes us to the second provision, the provision of an alternative plan, verses 11 through 27. Uh, first of all, we have Nathan to Bathsheba. It was necessary that the uninformed and aged King David be briefed immediately as to what was going on. Uh, he began, Nathan began that briefing by uh, telling Bathsheba what was happening, for apparently she didn't know either, and then of his plan to uh, perhaps uh, reverse the whole situation. Uh, and so he asked her, Have you heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king without King David's knowing it? Verse 11. Uh, this section of the text then falls into three parts. Nathan's talk to Bathsheba, 11 to 14. Bathsheba's talk to David, uh, 15 through 21. And Nathan's confirmation of Bathsheba's report, verses 22 to 27. So let's take up the three reports. The presumption of, first of all, of Nathan's talk to Bathsheba was that David had promised a long time ago on an oath to Bathsheba that her son would be the next king, verse 17. But while David shivered from lack of warmth and had unbelievably hesitated in keeping up with matters of state, Adonijah moved in with his opportunity uh, quite aggressively and uh, presented himself as fate to complete, to use a little Latin, since Solomon had not been invited to Adonijah's incarnation, Adonijah must have known that Solomon had been the favorite of David, so he had to beat his father to the punch. It is true, of course, that Adonijah was the oldest living heir of King David. All the other sons had either died or something had happened to them in the meantime. So uh, he therefore moved to gain popular support and a sudden recognition that he had not had previously. Bathsheba then, according to Nathan's plan, went into David's bedroom and reminded him of the oath he had made. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, David was still not alert enough. Uh, so she asked him, uh, as if by accident, uh, that uh, had he known about and had he approved for Adonijah to be king. For right now, at the spring at Enrogel, uh, Adonijah was being announced as king, and all of the children, his brothers and sisters, except Nathan, were there, and except, uh, excuse me, except uh, uh, Solomon was there, and nor was Nathan or others. So then Bathsheba talks to David, verse 15. And uh, she uh, bowed low before the king, and she asked, uh, uh, the king asked her in literal Hebrew, uh, what to you? <laughs> uh, as if he were barely alive and could utter but a few syllables. However, when David suddenly realized all that was going on, it came to him, and uh, he seemed as if all of a sudden, in verse 28, that something had to be done. So Bathsheba helped the king recall what he had promised. And uh, 
This then led to a whole different scenario. Uh, for Bathsheba added, Adonijah had sacrificed a large number of cattle, a large number of fatted calves, and sheep, uh, and uh, they were now enjoying a banquet. Uh, so she also added that if the king did not do something quickly, then as soon as the people of Israel had laid David to rest following his death, both she and her son would be treated as criminals, uh, or even worse, verse 21. And of course it was worse. So Nathan talks to Bathsheba, for as planned, while she was doing all this, in comes Nathan. <laughs> and as if to emphasize this for him in a way, he innocently pretended to pose a question as if he didn't know the answer. Have you, my lord, the king, declared Adonijah shall be king after you? and that he will sit on your throne. Today he has gone down and sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fatted calves, and sheep, and he has invited all the king's son and the commanders of the army and Abathar the priest. In fact, right now they're eating and drinking with him and saying, Long live King Adonijah! Hip, hip, hooray! Uh, verse 24-25. So Nathan carefully added that he, Zadok the priest, and Benaiah son of Jehoiada, and David's son Solomon, had not been invited to the installation of the new king. It was clear that nothing but trouble lay ahead for those who had not been invited. So Nathan continued to play dumb as he tepidly added, is this something my lord the king has done without letting his servants know who should sit on the throne of my lord and be king after him? Verse 27. Of course David uh, had not done that, and Nathan knew better too. But he put it that way so he would arouse whatever embers of fire were left in David's brain. So, this takes us to a third provision, the provision to install Solomon as king. Uh, this is in verses 28 through 53. So, David responds to Nathan's plan. It worked to a T. It was to the perfection, for David now suddenly is aroused and immediately swings into action, just as if it were David, he was David of the former days. He immediately offered uh, Bathsheba, uh, uh, he ordered her to come back into the th courtroom, and he reaffirmed to Bathsheba and Nathan his previous oath, verses 28 through verse 30. Not only did he affirm this promise to Bathsheba about Solomon being king, but David began giving a blizzard of orders that detailed how Solomon should be immediately anointed and installed as king. Zadok, the priest, still with uh, David, and Nathan the prophet, still with David, and Benaiah, head of the army, still with David, and his son Solomon were uh, to get the king's mule and go to the Gihon, G-I-H-O-N, spring, outside of Jerusalem. Someone's been to that spring, it's still operative today, and if you went through Hezekiah's tunnel, which is about, what, 1,500 feet long, where Hezekiah cut underneath the city so that the water could come in during siege and they could get drink and then closed it off outside so that the enemy would not have recourse to it. But that's the spring. Where is it located? On the east side of Jerusalem, right at the 
end of where the wall that goes around Jerusalem and the city, the ancient city of David, goes further to the south, right at that point. So after they had anointed David, they were to blow, after they anointed Solomon, I'm sorry, they were to blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon! Hip, hip, hooray. Verse 33. So then these uh, appointed officials were to bring Solomon up to the Gion Spring and have him sit on the throne of David uh, and he was to rule in place of David. Verse 35. All in one fell swoop. Wow. God had promised David that his dynasty would be established, what? In perpetuity. That had been in the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 to 16. Your throne, your dynasty, and your kingdom will be forever, forever, for I always get stuck on that word. Forever, forever, forever. It was to be eternal. And that God would make David's son his own son. And that he, the living God, would be a personal father to Solomon. And he would give him a throne, a dynasty, and a kingdom. Same one he'd given to David. David. So, that's in 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. Which is the great promise of the Bible. Uh, you've got to get Genesis 3.15... The promise made to Eve as the first covenant. Then the promise in Genesis 12 and 15 made to David. The covenant made to, sorry, Abraham. Abraham. And now the covenant made to David, 2 Samuel 7. If you can grab those three, Genesis 3, 15, Genesis 12 and 15, and 2 Samuel 7. Oh, add one more. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34, New Covenant. Now you got the whole Bible. Eden, the covenant made with Eve, the covenant made with David, the, uh, the covenant made with Abraham, the covenant made with David, and then the New Covenant. So by now, David was so routed and stirred up by what had come uh, to pass with his throne his dynasty and his kingdom, his house, uh, that uh, he went into high gear and he ignored uh, any other possibilities that might be afoot uh, by such a coup arranged by Adonijah. So despite the clear statement in the Davidic covenant made by God, with all of his provisions for the future that embraced uh, the story uh, that was uh, about to be unraveled by Adonijah, yet God still kept count. Adonijah's quest for the throne was fortunately met by Nathan's detailed counter plan. Does God use people in his plan to counter what could be a drastic result for a people or nation? You bet. You bet. That's why the disciples asked Jesus not to teach them how to teach. He didn't teach them how to heal. He didn't teach them how to do a lot of things. They asked one thing, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Because that's where the foundation of this world rests. In the work of God, as we men and women work together with the living God to hear his uh, uh, petition. So Adonijah responds then to Solomon's installation, verses 41 through 53. So when the noise of all the celebration that's going on up at Gion Spring, it's only several hundred yards away, uh, reached the ears of the people down at the spring at Ein Rugel, 
And the sound of the trumpet reached Adonijah, and the guests shouting, Long live King Solomon! Uh, they were just about finished with their feast. Adonijah was just going to go up and take over the throne. Verse 41. And Joab, the commander of the army, asked, Yeah, he should. What's the meaning of all the noise in the city of Jerusalem? That's what he asked. And with that, Jonathan, the son of Abathar the priest, he had two sons there. This one, Abathar, arrived. He had breaking news. And they said, oh, bring him in. He always has good news. Not this time. Adonijah invited Jonathan into the feast, hoping he carried good news, as he usually always did in the past. But Jonathan announced that such a hope was not the case. He said, no, not at all. I don't have good news. Rather, quote, our Lord, King David, has made Solomon king. Verse 43. Whoa! Boy, that must have hit them like a ton of bricks. Uh, these people almost lost their dinner. Jonathan must have been at the Gion Spring to witness all these happenings, for he sure knew a lot of details. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed Solomon as king of Israel, he announced, at the spring Gion, and they have put him on the king's mule. By the way, kings were uh, their favored installation animal was not a horse, but a mule. You'll see that in the, the book of Judges, for example. So what's more, Solomon has taken his seat on the royal throne, verse 47. <laughs> well, if you have that, it's all over. It's all over. So forget what's going to take place. Friends, this is so current. You can almost feel some of our history here. I don't know if you're tracking along with it. But at any rate, the royal officials, officials are currently congratulating him. Uh, and uh, Abathar is uh, 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 his... Uh, uh, son, Jonathan's son, is uh, saying here, May your God make Solomon's name more famous than David's name and his throne greater than David's. Verse 47. Greater than David's? Oy vey. Uh, this is really big news. And even David bowed in worship on his bed as he declared, quote, Praise be to the Lord the God of Israel, who has allowed my eyes to see a successor on my throne today. <laughs> I guess they all said to, about David, he's back. He's back. <laughs> he gets it. He gets it. Praise be to the Lord, who has allowed my eyes to see a successor. And it was the one he wanted and the one God wanted. So with this alarming report, Adonijah's guests wisely decided they should hurry home and appear as busy as they could with their own work. I guess so. Uh, and <clears throat> while his guests fled, Adonijah, however, was just too visible. So he must make a public, humiliating show of subservience to Solomon. The winner of the prize crown, verse 53. For Adonijah had by now, out of fear of Solomon, taken hold in the temple. He grabbed hold of the horns. The temple, four ends of it, had projections, which were all part of the altar. <clears throat> and that's where we get the concept of sanctuary. Sanctuary. So he went there. And uh, he grabbed hold of the horns on the altar. So uh, uh, Solomon was told about this. Uh, and his promise was, if Adonijah showed himself, quote, to be a worthy man, and the quote, verse 52, he would not lose one hair on his head. How about that? 
So Solomon sent men to bring Adonijah from his place in the sanctuary, holding on to the horns of the altar. They uh, ushered him into the uh, house of the, the palace of the king. So that brings us to the fourth provision, the provision of making the kingdom secure. And uh, that is uh, now in chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. In order to see that the throne, dynasty, and kingdom that God had given to David were made secure, some vigilant measures had to be taken. This theme of making secure, the Hebrew word kun, K-U-N, in English letters transliterated, the throne is the theme of this second chapter, verse 12, verse 24, verse 45, verse 46. So one, two, three, four, uh, emphasis on the throne. Therefore, just as chapter one, focused on the succession and transition of the kingdom. So chapter 2 focused on the security of the kingdom. That's always what you have to worry about in tightly contested contests for government, which we saw 2016 and again 2020. Uh, very, very similar. Therefore, David, in a most dramatic deathbed scene, gave instructions to his son Solomon about how to secure his kingdom. And that's what occurs in these 12 verses. Even though David was obviously quite frail at the time, he had forgotten little, and therefore he reminded his son of possible roadblocks that could occur to take away the security of his kingdom. But first, Solomon was reminded, be strong, quote, be strong and show yourself a man, verse 2. Be strong and show yourself a man. Furthermore, he was, quote, to walk in God's ways and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements, as written in the law of Moses, so that he might prosper in all that he did and wherever he went. Verse 3. And that has to be emphasized for all who hold human government today. They are made in the image of God. They are accountable to God. I don't care whether it's Hindu or uh, Islamic or uh, uh, democratic, uh, or whatever it is, they are to walk in God's ways and keep his decrees. Why? This world is belongs to him, and he will bring it to a final uh, a decree. And his laws and his requirements are written in the book of Moses, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Torah. Uh, and similar injunctions had likewise been given to worthy saints at the close of their lives, including Joseph, for example, and Genesis 50, verses 24 to 25. Moses, when he died in Deuteronomy 31, verses 1 through 8, and Joshua, when they were looking for a successor, Joshua 24, 1 through 28, notice all the terms used to describe the Lord's word are very similar to the ones he had given to Joseph and Moses and Joshua. Very, very similar. And if Solomon wanted to prosper, he would need to have a walk. What's a walk? Lifestyle. A lifestyle that was pleasing to God. And if our present leadership wants to prosper, they must have a lifestyle that is pleasing to God. One that listens to truth and justice and righteousness. Wow. Wow. 
Well, and one that enjoyed and obeyed the word of God. If they wish to see their kingdom, their nation remain secure. Verse 4. Today, few leaders of the world's nations think very much, if anything, about walking with the Lord or being faithful in obeying his word. But that is why there's so little security for the state of governments around the world. That explains it exactly. So therefore, let it be known for all who follow, true stability in life can only come through obedience to the word of God and to a faithful lifestyle of obeying him. Likewise, what is true on a personal level is also true on a national or governmental level. Stability and longevity are not dependent on an experience. Queen Elizabeth II did not get 96 years because of her experience, but was with her walking with God and God being faithful to her. So, uh, professional qualifications don't matter that much. Armies don't matter that much. Education doesn't matter that much. Pedigree doesn't matter. In comparison, in comparison to who God is. No, not even personal achievements. But most basically of all, it depends on our obeying God's word. Chapter 2, verse 4. So after David had told Solomon the most important matters for his success, he then gave some advice about keeping his eye on the leader of the army that he had used, Joab. Uh, verses 5 through 6. Joab had killed both Abner and Amasa, uh, um, um, Amasa, A-M-A-S-A, during peacetime, and it brought reproach on David's government uh, in former days. Uh, David said, son, keep your eye on that man. And Solomon was to deal with Joab in his wisdom, but he was not to let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. So Joab had also joined Adonijah's coup. Over against that advice, David urged Solomon to give special care and kindness to the sons of Barzillai of Gilead, who stood by David and offered him and his retinue as they fled from a former son who tried to take over the government uh, back in 2 Samuel 17, verses 27-29, and 19-30-40. However, David's advice on the Benjamite Shimei, who threw stones at him and cursed him, and David said, let him alone. Uh, if he's doing that by God, that's one thing. But if he's doing it on his own, God will take care of him. Well, as soon as Solomon was made king, oh, Shimei came and begged for forgiveness and said, I'm sorry for what I did to your father, David. Uh, and so uh, Solomon said, okay, but I'll tell you what. You stay in Jerusalem, and the day you step one foot out of Jerusalem, your life is gone. Well, we'll find out that his servants, two of his servants, ran away from him down to Philistia. Shimei heard about it, went after them, came back. Uh, Solomon called him in. He said, uh, what you do? He said, I had to retrieve my servants. He said, yeah, but the agreement was, don't step one foot out of here. And he was gone. That gives you some indication of the decisiveness that is required for government. 
And uh, so we come to some conclusions, and we must uh, sort of wrap this thing up. Uh, one, God's provision and providence, both of them are just as apparent through the movements and actions of godly men and women as they are in his direct and miraculous interventions in history. God works through people as well as he worked in Galilee by touching men and women personally. It's still the work of the sovereign God. God can still work through persons. That's why we're told, pray for those who lead us, whether it's in the family, in the marriage, in the church, in our work, or in government, honestly. And it's important for parents not to give free reign to their children lest they grow up to be tyrants, just as Adonijah. They just didn't know where the limits were. And so they are on call with God. I have another one I add here. I think we only had two on the slides. But the call to leadership doesn't come from the east or from the west or any other direction, but from the Lord himself. This is amazing. Amazing. And God calls. I've been personally twice in that position. I did not want it. I was asked to be dean of our seminary once. I said, I don't sense the call of God. Second time, I said, I still don't sense the call of God. Third time, my president came and, and found me up at the camp here uh, in Wisconsin at a parents' camp, and he said, I want to have dinner with you. I said, did our second candidate uh, for dean uh, collapse? He said, look, let's just have dinner. <laughs> he went into my question. He had. So he finally said, look, what will it take? I said, it'll take a call from God and a unified vote from the faculty. But this faculty never votes to all together on one issue, so I'm safe. Uh, but he went back, and I don't know how, I talked to all the faculty. He came to me and said, I have all the faculty. They said, yes. I don't know what he paid them. But uh, at any rate, that was it. And then I went to Gordon Conwell, and I was happy teaching four years. And they came to me and said, would you submit your resume? I said, for what? I'm already a teacher. They said, for president. Oh, I said, that's okay. I love teaching. I'll, I'll just stay here. And they kept it up and kept it up. And then uh, finally, they said, well, what do you think? I said, I'm praying about it. I still don't sense the call. And he said, well, what about our part? <laughs> I used my old trick. I said, if the whole faculty says yes, which I knew they wouldn't. The faculties are like herding cats. Uh, and you just can't do that. <clears throat> so uh, at any rate, he came back and he said, yeah, this guy said the same thing. I had them all agree. I know what that is. Doesn't come from the East, doesn't come from the West. It has to come from God. Has to come from God. So God is present even in the crises of life. Nothing is too big. Nothing is too small for his particular attention. So God's command to all who would walk with him and obey his word is what? Be strong and show yourself the man or the woman. Be a mensch. To use a little German. Uh, be a man. Uh, because that is what God calls for. What an interesting thing. We say, yeah, but Lord, look who you chose. 
this man mm, has a background. And, you know, Bathsheba and, you know, David. And it's interesting. God doesn't pick us because we got a good record. God doesn't call us because we were goody goodies. God doesn't call because we always obeyed. It's for his sake, for his reason. And we say, Lord, lead on. And that's what takes place in governments. That's what takes place in organizations. That's what takes place in industry. That's what takes place in homes, too, as well. What a great theme we have here in this man, Solomon. Wrote an awful lot of the sections. By the way, the I gave to you summer last on the Proverbs. They told me, the one that also told me Solomon's not ready, <laughs> that they put Proverbs to press. Uh, they also have put Daniel. Some of you were in a class to study. That's still coming, they tell me. Uh, so uh, I, I wait on them too as well. Well, uh, a lesson. Carnation time. Carnation for Charles III. Carnation for Solomon. But carnation also one day when we see the King of kings and Lord of lords who made us all and has called us particularly to walk before him. And What's our prayer? One prayer like disciples. Lord, Lord, Lord. We need to know how to pray. Teach us, teach us, teach us how to pray. Why? This world needs it. Our friends need it. They need our prayers. Some are facing some tight decisions. Not tight for the Lord, but for us. So, Lord, teach us how to pray even for our friends. And he will. He will. So God's been good to us. These have been very, very good days. And yet, awful days too as well. May our Heavenly Father walk with us all the way. Let me close in prayer. Thank you for attending today. And this is only the beginning of the study. Wait till we get into the rest of it and see what God is doing through this man. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You walk with us. You talk with us. And amazingly, you tell us each one we are your own. And so it was with these men and women, all of them, some who listened to you and some who said on their own they would go and achieve what they thought they would win, but greater is he who is among us than all of our own inventions. So, Lord Jesus, please bless us. Teach us how to pray for one another. There are some here this week that need your sustenance, your firm hand, and your proof that you are with them. Please be with them. And please, Heavenly Father, be with the nations of the world as they crown a new king in England and as we ourselves face in just two months a huge election with enormous, enormous implications. Teach us how to pray, Heavenly Father, and how to respond and help us to stand up and be the men and women that you want us to be. For it's in your name we pray, Jesus' name, amen.